People often dismiss psychedelic drug experiences as hallucinations, but users of DMT, a naturally occurring psychoactive compound, claim a very particular kind of experience that often feels as real to them as waking life. What's more, users often have encounters with strange sentient beings that seem to be more than mental fabrications. Further research on DMT promises to shed light on the mechanics of consciousness, and may even contribute to our understanding of other anomalous experiences, including UFO abductions and ancient Hebrew prophetism. N-N-dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, is a naturally occurring psychoactive compound that is widely prevalent in nature. It is found in the biochemistry of all humans, as well as in every reptilian and mammalian species whose tissues have been analyzed for it. It's also been found in hundreds of plants, and is likely present in tens of thousands more. Despite all this, DMT's function in biology is still essentially a mystery. Tellingly, it's one of the few compounds that our brains allow through the blood-brain barrier, which filters out all but a few essential substances. What the brain does with this compound is still unknown, but studies of animals' brains have shown increased levels under stress. DMT can be derived from various natural or synthetic sources and distilled to a crystalline form. When either smoked, snorted, injected, or ingested with certain enzyme inhibitors, DMT is intensely psychoactive, producing a powerful altered state of consciousness. At higher doses, most users claim to leave their bodies and interact with strange beings in fantastical settings. This has led a range of writers and researchers to propose that the compound must play some role in producing visionary, spiritual, and other altered states of consciousness, such as dreams and near-death experiences. Other plants, fungi, and animals contain compounds with DMT in their structure that also have powerful psychoactive qualities. After ingestion, psilocybin, the psychoactive ingredient in magic mushrooms, becomes psilocin, or 4-hydroxy-DMT. The Bufo alvarius, also called the Colorado River Toad, or Sonoran Desert Toad, secretes a venom from its skin containing 5-methoxy-DMT, or 5-MeO-DMT, and bufotenin, or 5-hydroxy-DMT, which is also present in mushrooms, plants, and mammals. People have been using DMT for its medicinal and psychoactive properties for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Rock paintings from pre-Neolithic people living in the Sahara Desert provide evidence for the religious use of psychoactive mushrooms up to 9,000 years ago. In the ancient world, DMT was sourced from the bark and leaves of acacia trees, the roots or leaves of reed grass, and in the powdered seeds of cowage in India. The Chinese have been distilling 5-hydroxy-DMT from toad venom for at least a few hundred years. Indigenous peoples in North and South America have long used DMT-containing plants for hunting, healing, and recreation, and to help induce spiritual experiences. Christopher Columbus was the first to record the use of DMT for psychoactive effect in a letter from 1496, discussing a snuff used by the Tainos natives of the West Indies to commune with spirits. The snuff, now called Yopo, among other names, contains both DMT and 5-hydroxy-DMT. Several different tribes in South America drink a tea called ayahuasca that usually gets its DMT from the leaves of the Psychotria viridis plant. Shamans consume and administer the brew as a means of divination and as a way to communicate with dead ancestors and heal members of the tribe. In 1931, the Canadian chemist Richard Mongska first synthesized DMT in a laboratory setting, but no one experimented with its psychoactive effects for another quarter century. In 1955, Gordon Wasson, an amateur ethnomycologist from New York City, traveled to Oaxaca, Mexico to partake in a psilocybin mushroom ceremony with the indigenous Mazatecs. Wasson detailed his experiences in Life magazine in 1957 and helped bring psilocybin to popular attention. Around the same time, many in the scientific community began experimenting with DMT. 
Its psychoactive effects were first scientifically documented in a study by Hungarian psychiatrists in 1956, and published two years later. After 1961, scientists confirmed DMT's presence in the human brain, blood, and urine, with later studies finding DMT and 5-MeO-DMT elsewhere in the body. Research into psychoactive drugs flourished throughout the 1960s, with hundreds of scientific papers and several books published on the topic. Psychotherapists studied a number of compounds for their potential in relieving chronic mental disorders, and others took interest in their ability to invoke mystical and religious experiences. In the now famous Good Friday experiment at Boston University in 1962, Walter Punka gave 10 of 20 divinity students capsules containing psilocybin before having them listen to a Protestant church service over loudspeakers. Most of the volunteers who received the psilocybin reported having a more mystical experience than those who were given the active placebo. This boom in research came to a halt when the US government passed the Controlled Substances Act in 1970 and immediately prohibited all human trials for DMT and other Schedule I drugs. Many similar laws were passed in other countries, making it nearly impossible for scientists anywhere to even find, let alone study, DMT. Still, black markets continued to fuel use around the world. The Harvard psychologist Timothy Leary, who had studied psilocybin in the lab when it was legal, famously experimented with a range of psychedelic drugs, including DMT, and advocated for them publicly. American brothers Terence and Dennis McKenna used DMT and other substances in the 1960s and later wrote a book about psilocybin mushroom cultivation. Dennis then obtained his PhD in botanical sciences and now studies psychedelic compounds. In the 1980s, Terence began giving public lectures on consciousness and psychedelics, helping to popularize both DMT and psilocybin mushrooms in the English-speaking world. In the summer of 1988, Terence had a brainstorming session with Dr. Rick Strassman, professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, which Strassman credits with helping him focus his research on DMT. After spending two years clearing regulatory requirements, Strassman began human trials on the compound in December of 1990, the first U.S. government-approved and funded research into a psychedelic in over 20 years. He aimed to measure and describe the biological and psychological effects of DMT, and to document people's qualitative descriptions of their experiences. His team administered 400 injections of DMT to roughly 60 volunteers at the University of New Mexico Hospital, taking only volunteers with previous psychedelic experiences. In 2001, Strassman published his research in DMT, The Spirit Molecule, in which he concluded that the DMT experience led to an awareness of what we currently call spiritual levels of existence. Since Strassman began his study, there has been a renaissance in psychedelic research, and a dramatic shift in the way that psychoactive substances are portrayed in the news and other media. In 2010, director Mitch Schultz produced a popular documentary on DMT, adopting the same name as Strassman's book. Strassman, Dennis McKenna, and other leading researchers met for a DMT conference in 2015, and published the proceedings as the DMT Dialogues in 2018. Scientists such as Christopher Timmerman of the Psychedelic Research Group at Imperial College London, Dr. David Luke of the University of Greenwich, and Edda Frechka, Chairman of the Psychiatry Department of Hungary's University of Debrecen, are just a few who are actively researching DMT today. Timmerman and others did EEG scans on the brains of DMT users and found a decrease in alpha waves in the brain, as well as an increase in signal complexity, consistent with users of other psychedelic compounds. However, they also found an increase in delta and theta waves, normally most prevalent in sleep. New research aims to extend the DMT experience so as to allow for easier study. Many other scholars around the world are studying psilocybin, 5-MeO-DMT, and ayahuasca as well, especially for their applications in healing and mental health. 
psilocybin has been found to be very effective in reducing cluster headaches and helping people beat their tobacco addictions. And ceremonial use of ayahuasca, too, can help users end substance dependence. The therapeutic potential of pure DMT is less clear. The human experience of smoking, injecting, or ingesting pure DMT varies by the dosage and differs from person to person, and roughly 5% of users experience little to no effects at all. The experience is also heavily influenced by the environment, as well as the mindset and expectations of the user. Among Strassman's participants who responded to the injection, the effects were felt immediately. Shortly after injection, the participants said that they felt physically lighter, as though their consciousness had left their body. Some reported feelings of hot or cold, or the sensation of a crushing weight. Most of them remarked that colors became more intense, and reported hearing unusual sounds, such as an oscillating wah-wah noise, a ringing, or a crackling. Later in the experience, some reported hearing musical or heavenly sounds, and others reported spoken voices, and even a cartoonish sproying sound. Within about a minute of intensifying sensations, nearly all participants said that they experienced an intense rush that peaked around the 2-3 to three minute mark, and soon found themselves in an entirely new setting. Many saw kaleidoscopic patterns of geometry that morphed into fantastical scenes. Some participants saw starfields and planets, while others saw sprawling buildings and intricate machines, as well as plants and animals. One volunteer described seeing a large orangish sphere that flashed and sparkled. A minority of people experienced instances of telepathy, out-of-body experiences, and clairvoyance. After 8 to 10 minutes, users felt that the altered state was in decline, and most had fully returned to their normal state of consciousness after 30 to 45 minutes. Despite the fantastical content, most of the participants did not feel that their trips were hallucinations, but real-world experiences. Most participants explicitly distinguished their trips from previous experiences of dreams and other drugs, and many felt as though they had perceived another dimension of reality. Some volunteers even called the DMT world more real than real. Users reported that they felt mentally alert and aware throughout the entire experience, and had retained full memory of the events. Strassman identified marked changes in the user's bodies, including increased heart rate, blood pressure, pupil diameter, and body temperature. A minority of participants had some negative experiences, including shakiness, heart palpitations, and nausea, and a few felt that it was the most frightening experience of their lives. Many felt anxiety, but those that were able to let go and relax had the best outcomes. Over half of Strassman's volunteers reported encounters with strange sentient humanoids or animals. Later research by David Luke found that at higher doses, nearly all participants encounter these beings. The first record of an entity encounter on a DMT-related compound comes from the world's first recorded use of ayahuasca by an Ecuadorian geographer in 1858. Manuel Villavincencio said that he was flying over a panorama of cities, parks, and towers before finding himself in a forest having to defend himself from terrible beings. The Hungarian psychiatrist Stefan Sara reported that one of the participants in his 1956 study said that the room was full of spirits, and a schizophrenic patient claimed to see strange black creatures that resembled dwarves. Another volunteer encountered what she described as two quiet sunlit gods who nodded in her direction. Around the same time, a US research team was studying the effects of DMT on psychotic patients, and reported a volunteer who found herself being hurt by horrible orange beings that were clearly not human. 
In his lectures in the late 80s and 90s, Terence McKenna shared his experiences with beings he called self-transforming machine elves, a term that has since become very popular in psychedelic circles. But Strassman's participants described a wide range of different beings. Many saw therianthropes, or animal-human hybrids, as well as human-machine hybrids and animal hybrids. Some described the beings as insectoid, or reptilian, while others described them as mechanical, or robotic. Others were made of nothing but light. One participant saw two entangled serpents that were both covered in eyes. One described being in a space station, and guided by android-like creatures that were a mix of crash test dummies and Star Wars stormtroopers, many of which were busy with some unknown task. Some participants perceived only parts of beings, while others saw only silhouettes or shadow forms. Still others only heard voices, or felt a presence. Dr. Luke has found that even participants with no prior knowledge of the compound encountered the same kinds of entities. Often, the beings engage the participant in communication in the form of speech, telepathy, or visual symbols. Some beings gave warnings, while others offered help. Some healed participants, while others harmed them. Still others engaged in sexual acts with experiencers, or performed unfamiliar surgical procedures on their bodies. Many participants felt that the beings were there to teach, protect, or support them. One participant described small gremlins with tails and wings, alongside larger beings that she felt were there to sustain and support her. Participants frequently claimed that the beings caused them to feel or think certain things, often by directly engaging with their bodies. One participant described being pulled through a maze by a band of jokers, with big noses and bells on their hats. She felt loved by the beings, and sensed that she had a new body in that moment that was much more aware. Another participant found himself overlooking a cityscape that started toggling through different colors. He noticed a middle-aged female with light green skin sitting beside him, who was turning a dial that seemed to control the color of the scene. After asking the volunteer what he'd like, the woman stood up, walked over and touched his forehead, then used a sharp object to open up a panel in his temple, which released a tremendous amount of pressure from his head. DMT is only one compound among a range of other psychedelics that all produce dazzling and mysterious effects. Users of LSD, mescaline, and salvia divinorum sometimes report similar transportative experiences and encounters with alien-like entities. People can also have similar experiences without drugs, through hypnosis, chanting, hyperventilation, fasting, and sleep deprivation. In light of this fact, researchers have argued that it's the body that produces the experience, and not the DMT or any other drug. Perhaps DMT and related compounds function like keys to locks inside the mind, granting us access to different networks in the brain. Repeated DMT experiences do not build a tolerance in the user, unlike all other drugs which have a diminishing effect with each use. Many have hypothesized that altering the levels of DMT in one's brain would result in an effect similar to adjusting the dials on a radio, allowing people to tune in to another wavelength of external information. Computational neurobiologist and pharmacologist Andrew Gallimore argues that DMT appears to switch us into another world-building mode to perceive a different plane of reality. Edith Frechka hypothesizes that DMT and other altered states of consciousness allows the brain to act as a type of quantum array antenna to receive non-local information. Drawing on indigenous and shamanistic perspectives, Dennis McKenna feels that DMT and related compounds are catalysts for cognitive evolution, created by an intelligence in nature to reconnect us with the natural world. In 2014's DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, Strassman drew connections between the DMT experience and descriptions of prophetic visions in the Hebrew Bible, arguing that these connections suggest common underlying mechanisms. Like the DMT beings, 
The angels and other entities encountered by the prophets demonstrated will, intellect, and awareness, and engaged in interactions that involved healing, harming, protecting, or communicating information. However, the canonical prophets placed much more importance on the messages being conveyed by these beings, and less importance on the phenomenology of their experiences. DMT users, by contrast, tend to be overwhelmed by the experience itself, and receive no clear message or revelation. Some of Strassman's participants referred to the beings as aliens, though none of the descriptions matched the short, almond-eyed greys whose image was then quite prevalent in U.S. culture. Still, Strassman noticed a lot of similarities to the abduction experiences documented by the Harvard psychiatrist John Mack. Both kinds of experiences typically began with bright lights, strange sounds, and vibrations in the body, and frequently involved feelings of paralysis. These beings, too, often gave warnings to experiencers, and did surgical-type work on their bodies. Strassman noted that nearly all medieval Jewish philosophers taught that the contents of the prophetic state, the visions of angels, demons, and apocalyptic scenery, were reflections of our own imaginations. Faced with the impossibility of representing the supernatural in physical form, it was thought that our minds drew on imagery from our memories and experiences to render the ineffable in a way that was coherent to the human senses. Similarly, ufologist John Keel felt that the physical forms that the UFOs and aliens took in people's experiences were cobbled together from the images available in their own memories and expectations. In other words, the way that they appear may say more about ourselves than it does about them, whatever they are. There is still a lot to learn about the role of DMT, what it does in nature, what it does in the human brain, and why it produces such fantastical psychoactive effects. But the places users go to, and the entities that they encounter there, have become a particular focus of inquiry. Maybe these beings are spirits, demons, angels, or aliens. Or maybe they're just projections of our subconscious minds. But studying them may reveal something about the workings of consciousness, and the nature of abductions, prophecy, and other anomalous experiences. Want to see more from Think Anomalous? Remember to click the bell so that you get notified when we make new videos, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.